we are naturally so selfish and self-absorbed that it really takes intentionality mm -hmm. to um, to think about being like Christ in that relationship. And so uh, Brett often says, you know, if you want to find out how selfish you are, get married. You'll, you'll find out because it's like having a mirror, you know, in front of you. Welcome to the Faithful Fathering Podcast. My name is Rick Words, founder and president of Faithful Fathering, where we encourage and equip dads to be faithful fathers. It's a dad that prioritizes physical presence, is engaged emotionally, and leads spiritually by example. This podcast series that focuses on relationships ministry and you know, what is a healthy relationship today. And, uh, of course, one of the most important relationships in our lives are is the marriage relationship. And I can't think of anyone more qualified to talk about marriage than my dear friends uh, that founded the Home Encouragement Ministry, and that's Brett and Kelly Hurst. Welcome to the studio. Thank you for joining Thank us. Thank you very much. Tell us a little bit about the, the founding and the, just the energy behind, the passion behind Home Encouragement. Well, um Back in 2006, one night, as bizarre as it may sound, in the middle of the night, it felt like God was giving me an impression to start a nonprofit, but I had no idea what that meant. I didn't really know what nonprofits did or what they were about. And um, anyway, over the next several weeks um, uh, after I uh, had conveyed those thoughts to Kelly. In fact, I was hoping that she would just shoot it all down so that I could get back to my typical abnormal schedule. But uh, when I kind of spit out uh, the kind of the, just a loose conception of it, she looked me in the eye and said, that is something we absolutely have to do. Uh, so we were off and then talked to you, actually, and some other people that, uh, that were already in the nonprofit world and through prayer and discernment, uh, it got honed down what we thought it was going to be we thought it was going to be a ministry specifically to married couples that were in the ministry and uh, maybe providing a kind of a lifeboat uh, idea of safety for couples that maybe were maybe fearful to be vulnerable because it might cost them uh, some stature in their church or in their position their vocation and so forth uh, but as we kind of started working through it. It just kept broadening and broadening. And so it's it's about marriage. Uh, really, anything that uh, is involved in marriage, we're, we're involved in as well. So that's everything from premarital counseling, which we've done for over 20 years. I've been leading a series on that, to uh, at the other end of the spectrum, couples in crisis, affair recovery, um, uh, and just moving couples from good to great, everything in between. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's only by the grace of God that we fell into this, but uh, but it's something that it really is a passion for us, and we've certainly uh, been humbled and privileged to, to do it together. Well, it's been said that uh, you know marriage is the closest thing we have to our relationship with Christ. I know you guys are coming up on 40, but how many years have you all been married? 37. 37, 37 years. Months, yeah. I, that, uh, that it's amazing how quick that time goes by, isn't it? But uh, I know you've you've had the school of of all the things you've dealt with in marriage, and now you get to share that with these other uh, the younger couple. Is is marriage the cult in this day's culture? Is marriage really alive and well? Mm, I think it is. Uh, you know, studies and surveys still show that most Americans who are not married want to be married. Mm -hmm. um, they don't always want to be married like couples they see married. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of couples like will say, yeah, <laughs> like a lot of couples will tell us, you know, well, you know, my, my parents are still married. I'm not ne necessarily want that marriage, but I do want to be married. And so um, I think, it, you know, even though the, the amount of marriages happening have dipped some, um, I think people still want to be married. That's what they, they want to find that that person, you mm -hmm. know, and spend their and share their life with somebody. Mm. But I think um, marriage is, we always say, you know, marriage is the best laboratory for spiritual formation if you'll let it be that. Mm. And I don't know why that is. I mean, the Apostle Paul says in the New Testament that it's a mystery how it works. I agree after 37 <laughs> years, it is a mystery. <laughs> but there is something about 
your marriage relationship is the only, you know, if you think back to your relationship coming up with your parents, that was a different dynamic. And then if you are parents and you have children and grandchildren, that's a different dynamic. Those are all blood related, usually relationships. Mm -hmm. Your your, uh, relationship with your spouse is very different. Mm. And you we are naturally so selfish and self-absorbed that it really takes intentionality Mm -hmm. to um to think about being like christ in that relationship and so uh brett often says you know if you want to find out how selfish you are get married you'll you'll find out because it's like having a mirror you know in front of you especially as kids wait so late these days you know my bride and i were married at 22 we were babies we kind of grew up together (laughs) yeah exactly it's a different different dynamic now, I know that you you talk about premarital counseling, and I want to give you a shout out because uh, you, you you gave my daughter mm-hmm. uh, and her fiance premarital counseling about four years ago. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, my particular concern was they were on different spectrums of the, uh, the political spectrum. They're on different ends, mm-hmm. and they thought they were just going to have to talk two weeks every four years, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. But you broke through that. But what what are some of those uh, the biggest challenges that you're seeing in these young marriages uh, today? Yeah, I think um, just the uh, intense pressure not to get married. One thing that we've talked a lot about recently is kind of a reversal of trends of how it was a, maybe one or two generations ago. It was more common, like you said, you got married when you were 22. Uh, probably didn't have a lot of money then, probably weren't very far as being established in your career and your identity and all that kind of thing. Uh, you know, in the early years of our marriage, we were cutting out coupons, including one coupon for a hamburger that we would split. And we looked forward to that because that, that was just like a, a big celebration. It was a big meal. It was a big meal, exactly. So it was uh, marriage in those days was more thought of as a foundational type of experience, where now it's migrated to being more of a what they might call a capstone event. In other words, couples feel like they uh, should and desire to get everything straight. All in, their ducks in a row. All their ducks in a row, as if you can. <laughs> uh, you know, get your career established, get all your experience, you know, you're full into adulting. And then if it fits, then you get married at the end of that time and and then take off from there there's nothing wrong with getting married in your 30s or 40s or 50s but uh the advantage of those of us that got married uh younger is that we go through a little bit more suffering together Mm -hmm. and and character building together and and that bonds you the struggle bonds you you know and Mm -hmm. so forth so we're we're not saying one is better than the other we're just noting the change culturally Mm -hmm. I think another issue for premarital couples that's challenging is so many couples live together before they get married, and even a lot of Christian couples do. And, you know, while we won't unpack why that's maybe not a great design to do, it it just, it it gives couples, I think, a false sense of commitment because they often think to themselves, well, of course we're committed. We're sharing a house together. We're, you know, getting, we're planning to get married. Um, and they also think it's the prudent th- thing that's to the do. That's practical thing Like to you do wouldn't too, go right? buy a Corvette without test driving yeah. it first, you know. Yeah. So they feel like this is a logical step to make sure that, you know, uh, that they are going to be compatible together before they make the big plunge. Sorry yeah. to interrupt. No, and so I was going to say that that just um, it doesn't really make it harder to teach premarital principles, but it just feels like you're talking about things where uh, often couples will think, "Well, we're already we're already doing that. We're already mm-hmm. learning. We've already learned all that." When they might not really have because they haven't been married doing it. The commitment level is different. And the great deception of the commitment level of living together without being married is that uh, you feel like you are completely committed to one another, but of course you're not, Mm -hmm. you know, you're not fully committed to one another. So the net result of that is that you are uh, unwittingly practicing non-commitment. So you're putting into practice and you're reinforcing a, a, a pattern and a series of events that exemplify non-commitment which can produce problems uh, if, when and if you do finally get married, uh, you've got this 
practice that you've uh, been a part of for so many years that that's resembles more non-commitment than full commitment. Right, right. Now, along those lines, I, I, I've shared the story before, uh, but in, in the counselor season of fathering, I had a pastor friend whose son came to him and said, I'm going to move in with my girlfriend. And, and he went through the whole diatribe of statistics don't say, show this works, it's shallow commitment, all this stuff. And about halfway, about five minutes in, he realized his son wasn't asking him, he was telling him. Right. And at that juncture, he had to make a decision. Do I draw a line in the sand or do I love unconditionally? What, what do you have to say to parents that may have a child that's in that realm right now and just say to encourage them? How, how, what, would you, what would your advice be for their response? We've experienced that personally. One of our kids lives with their partner and, um, you know, we, they, they knew how we felt when they were asking and not, not asking, but telling us what they were going to do. You know, they're adults and it's their life to live. They know how we feel that we would prefer them to be married. But what we've done on the, in the conversation with them is just encourage them to get married. I mean, we love both of them very much. We think they're very compatible. They've been together for a good, you know, few years now. And so I think it's just, you know, I think at the end of the day, when we when we cut off from our kids based on different, you know, beliefs or ideas or that sort of thing, I think that maybe causes more damage later on. But if we can stay in conversation and relationship with them and and they know that we have the respect to, to let them live their lives, even if it's something we disagree with. Yeah. I think that plays out best in the end. There's no ambiguity yeah. <laughs> where, where we are. <laughs> they know where we stand on it, but, uh, but we also uh, want them to know that we do love them unconditionally mm -hmm. and, uh, and we pray for them. And I mean, they know all that. They know what, our desire, what the desires of our heart are for them, for mm -hmm. their for their betterment, you know, for them to enjoy life more fully. Mm -hmm. So it's okay to disagree. I think it is. Yeah, that's a, that's a <laughs> revolutionary concept, but I, I think it's hard to push Christianity if we don't learn to love as Christ's love, which yeah. is unconditionally, right? Exactly. Uh, just respect. Uh, certainly understand that there is a difference what we believe, what we don't believe, but that, that unconditional love will, will heal everything, right? Yeah, and, and it did in my friend's case. He, they did marry. They have blessed him with grandkids, very similar oh, to you guys. Wow. Just It's been a wonderful situation. Yeah. So that's, that's good. Awesome. Now, I know you guys also do, uh, besides premarital, you do some tune-up weekends. You do date nights. Tell us a little bit about the, the full dimension of the ministry. How, how you We have an event called Dinner and a Marriage, which is just date nights for couples. Um, we uh, started the one in Katy uh, about 16 years ago now. Uh, we're still going strong with that one. And then at different times, they're different around the places in the city and out of town and so forth. It's just a time where couples can come and have a good meal, get a little bit of light marriage enrichment. Um, and we learned a long time ago that even the marriage research field says that it's more important to date after you're married, date each other, <laughs> not date other people, date each other after you're married than when before you're married. And I think that's true because couples who don't engage in just finding time to reconnect, you know, couples, especially if they're raising a family and working, they're doing so much what we call shoulder to shoulder work. You know, mm -hmm. they're raising the kids, they're working, they're running the house. And they often don't give themselves permission to look at each other in the eyes and, and re reconnect as man and woman, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so those kinds of events give them permission to do that. And the magic really is not what Brett and I say from the front of the room. The magic really is that they have an hour, an hour and a half to just have the phones put away. No kids are climbing on them, trying to, you know, interrupt and so forth. And that's a that's a magical moment. Mm -hmm. And I think God even expands that time if mm -hmm. we, you know, give into it. But our, our tune-ups too are also for couples who just either, maybe they're in a good place and they just want to learn a few communication tools to just go to the next level. Sometimes they're in crisis. Mm -hmm. but, but, but back to your marriage, uh, how, how would someone plug into that? I'm just thinking of a, of a couple that, you know, maybe they're doing tag team. They still just have two kids. So it's man-to-man -man defense. Mm -hmm. One's going one direction, one's going the other direction. Mm -hmm. What's the best way for, how, how do they find a group or how would you encourage them to maybe initiate a group or just initiate the process mm -hmm. yeah so if they're in this local area you know dinner and a marriage is available uh and and we're available uh to do 90 minute intensives that are called marriage tune-ups we also do those on zoom so we can do them obviously mm -hmm. anyone in the world and we 
do do that. So that's an, that's another potential connection point. Something that's benefited us personally is something called a married married life group. We've been in a married life group for 17 years, uh, a total of seven couples, and that is a once a month gathering. It's it kind of looks like a supper club, but it's not a supper club. It's it's more the, intentional. It's far more intentional. It's all about talking about marriage. I mean, there's some initial conversation about the kids and sports and all the things that uh, couples that have been married a, a good while are inevitably going to discuss, but we're, we're together to talk about our marriages. Mm. And so it was very important for us to s- start a group for ourselves so that we wouldn't uh, always feel the pressure to be on like we are right now in this conversation talking about marriage health. We want to f- talk about our own marriage. Be real. Yeah, exactly, and let her hair down and so forth. So that has been extremely uh, beneficial for us. And that's something anybody can do anywhere, you know, with five or six other couples. Uh, and uh, the, the benefits just are compounded mm-hmm. from that. In fact, uh, one of the funny things is uh, since we've been in ours so long, uh, the kids now that are all virtually in college age or beyond, uh, you know, but some of them were really little when we started and, and they would get curious about, no, you're going to that, what's that married group? Are, are y'all in crisis or, you know, you know, what's, what's going to, should we be concerned and all that kind of thing? But now we've heard so many from these uh, grown kids uh, that have, uh, some of them have gone on to get married themselves that they want to do the same thing and they want to carry that legacy on Mm. because they've seen the benefit of it and they've seen the commitment of uh, their parents just doing this on a regular basis year in and year out. Mm. Um, And that can be in your social circles or in your church, either way, just uh, might take a bold might take a bold move like saying, hey, would you guys like to go out to dinner as a couple, yeah. as couples as one night, and then yeah. that kind of starts it. Okay. Absolutely, yeah. and we'd be willing to help anybody. You know, any of these things that we talk about, people can reach out to us and mm-hmm. we'll, we'll give them whatever time we can to, to help encourage them or give them the quick best practices on how to get those things started. And that uh, that's home and courage. Go ahead and give your website. What is mm-hmm. your web? homeencouragement.org and there's actually a page on there called Married Life Groups okay. with a little primer podcast episode that kind of breaks down what it is, what it's not, mm-hmm. and gives some resources there. Okay. So. Now, back to your dinner and a marriage, is, are, do you have those at different areas around town as well? Is we that do. something you're looking for folks to start up as well? Uh, we love when <laughs> couples approach us and want to uh, start one. Um, we've had them in Austin, College Station, San Antonio, all around different parts of Houston. Um, yeah, and the COVID sort of put it, you know, put that to rest for I'd a little like bit. I'd like to never hear that word I know, again. I, I know, <laughs> me too. I, I can't believe I just said that, but it is kind of true. It kind of halted everything. So um, we've got, we're, we're getting them up and running again. Clear Lake, Sugar Land, College Station. We hopefully will have one inside the loop um, soon. So yeah, we're getting them up and running again. Fantastic. And you also have weekend retreats. Is that the, what, that's kind of the pinnacle experience, but is that just a whole different uh, uh, focus. Yeah, we, go ahead. No. <laughs> we have an This annual. is how you get along in marriage. You <laughs> say, no, dear, your turn. And then the man says, yes, dear. The two most important well, words as they in marriage. Say, you can be right or you can be happily married. So I defer everything to my we, wife. We typically will uh, lead a fall retreat. every. We've got one coming up the first weekend of October, uh, which is also on our website. And um, it's only 24 hours, but it feels like you've gotten away for a couple of days. Mm-hmm. We, it's kind of very curated to not only hopefully have good content and that sort of thing, but also give couples time to themselves. You know, mm-hmm. we give them a date night on Saturday night where they can just go and do whatever or stay in and order room service if they'd rather, you know, just to have that time together. So we always get really great feedback that it feels like, a good amount of both. Good mm-hmm. good teaching, good content, a lot of fun, but also downtime for themselves, which couples need, I think. Fantastic. Absolutely. Everybody needs some downtime yeah. these days, that's for sure. I think that at post-COVID, the devil's come back on steroids with busyness. It's true. <laughs> we used to hear during COVID, we would hear from couples who would say, we're loving this season of family dinners every night. And we all, as a family, we walk the dog every night and we're never going to go back to the busy, you know, and now here we are. (laughs) Yeah. Our marriage tune-ups 
picked up quite a bit in in COVID. Not not so much for crisis, but people were getting just how to manage being together all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was funny. We I remember this one woman said to to us on a tune up. She said. It's, it's not that we're in crisis. We don't hate each other. But if I have to look at him for one more minute, I'm going to just pull <laughs> fire air out, you know. <laughs> then we also have a podcast that we've done for uh, like this, but uh, for what, 14 years? Yeah. But it, we call it the slowest growing podcast <laughs> in the world because we don't we don't post episodes every single week, and so uh, we. But it's we 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 put the podcast out there, and it's called Marriage to the Max, and you can get it at any podcast platform. But we put it out there because we wanted content to be easily accessible because we felt like we were having the same conversation oftentimes with couples over and over again. We were like, we need to record this stuff and kind of That's put good. it out there. So well done, well yeah. done. Now, what are any final? tips for dads out there that uh, maybe are in a great marriage or maybe just don't feel like they're moving in the right direction any final tips or suggestions sure uh, yeah I think the the key word that we use the most in marriage education is intentionality you know uh, certainly communication is always something that we can improve that uh, using marriage tune-ups as an example you know sometimes we're sitting with couples that are in they've already filed with attorneys uh, they're in severe crisis. Uh, on the other end, end of the spectrum, we've we've got friends that also lead marriage things that come to us do marriage tune-ups just to make sure that their marriage is moving from from good to great. So it's it's just always staying in that posture of moving from good to great. There's always something more that God wants to grow us in in the depth of our marriage relationships. Usually. Communication is involved in that. So whether you're in crisis or whether you're happy as clams, you can always communicate more effectively with one another. So a lot of those conversations can center center around tools and tips and specific things that are tied to their personalities and their situations and circumstances uh, that will enhance greater communication. I think the, the number one thing, and this is backed by secular research, is that the more couples move closer towards each other and emphasize uh, you know greater admiration for one another, greater affection and respect for one another. I, you know and you listen to that and you go, well duh, of course, that's the answer. But it's astounding how frequently it does not happen because we get off doing the thing. you know we, we have so many other things that we put our hands to and we neglect, what we said was going to be our most important human relationship. And I want to say this too, uh, we, we understand clearly not everyone is called to marriage, and certainly not everyone is called to marriage at any given time. But on the other hand, we think that everyone benefits when we all support, societally speaking, stronger marriages, mm. because stronger marriages create stronger families, stronger families create stronger communities, and so forth and so on. Mm-hmm. So uh, we never, I mean, we have plenty of conversations with single and divorced and, you know, uh, people widowed, pe- people that are in other circumstances. Um, but uh, so one's not better than the other, uh, but there is something very unique about a marriage relationship that mirrors uh, the intimacy that the Trinity has within itself and that we are to have with God. Sure, and thus the need for encouragement on that front, right? Yeah. And that's the name thus the name of the ministry, Home Encouragement. Visit homeencouragement.org for access to some of the resources, the podcasts, other things that uh, Brett and Kelly have going on. And uh, the intentionality is a key word, be intentional in your relationship with your bride and uh, so dads just uh, understand that your relationship in marriage is a reflection of your relationship with Christ. If you're doing that well, your kids will catch what you've got, which is a relationship with Jesus the Christ. Thanks so much for being in the studio and uh, blessing to have you all here. And uh, thank you very much. It's been a real privilege. Us. Thank you, Rick.